This is a show where we take a look at what's coming to this week's edition of the North Coast Journal. I'm your host, Tanya Shrum, and we are joined by Arts and Features Editor Jennifer Fumiko Cahill and our California Local Journalism Fellow, Kelby McIntosh. Welcome to you both. How you doing, Tanya? Oh, I'm doing great. Looking forward to more rain in the forecast. Of course you are. You're one of those people. (laughs) <laughs> love some <laughs> early rain love it put those fires out in orleans please okay yes i will cheer for rain in that case absolutely i'm just like track in no lightning track in no lightning <laughs> well we have some marvelous stories coming to this week's edition and it looks like you're going to cover that story for us. Jennifer, would you like to tell us what's coming to this week's cover story? Absolutely. This week we have the story Freeing Aaron Bjorkstrand on the cover, and that is, you know, my colleague Thaddeus Greenson, our news editor, um, took a dive into this case. And this is something that he's been working on for some months now. And so we've been talking about it in the newsroom. And, um, you know, I finally got to read the whole thing all together and, um, after talking to him about this and talking about this subject, which is resentencing, um, it's been, it's really been something. It's been like a whole journey. Um, the resentencing story is one that Thad's been following with, um, from a number of angles. Uh, for one thing, uh, you might remember the story of Stephen Dinsmore, a local man whose um, resentencing ended up freeing him. First, he was freed and then sort of yanked back and then it was a it's been a tenuous and difficult process to figure out how resentencing works in Humboldt County. Um, we've been sort of behind on it. And then now that some things are moving forward, it's not without bumps. Um, and this story sure has some bumps, let me tell you. Um, and this story, unfortunately, has some parallels to the Dinsmore piece. It got wild. So. I should start by saying uh, who Aaron Bjorkstrand is. So Aaron Bjorkstrand went to prison after um, committing an armed robbery during which he shot a clerk uh, named Aaron McCaw in uh, McKinleyville gas station twice. And that shooting was no joke. Um, The surgeries, the pain that Aaron McCaw still still lives with are pretty serious. And you know, he's, it's traumatizing. He has, you know, he's still, um, you know, living with fear, living with pain, living with the um, outcomes of having a few feet of intestine having to be removed from a gut shot. Um, So it's been, it's not to minimize, you know, the damage that was done in this. Um, And Aaron Bjorkstrand was uh, incarcerated for 26 years. And he was essentially given, you know, this massive life sentence for um, for this shooting, but he was at the time 15 years old and tried and sentenced as an adult, which we don't really do anymore. If in fact, if Bjorkstrand was tried today for the same crime, it would have been as a 15 year old, he would have served seven years tops, but he served 26 of it. Um, and the mitigating circumstances, or at least the circumstances that make you see why we don't try children as adults, hopefully, in his story are really uh, quite striking. So what happened was um, Deputy Public Defender Adrian Kamada brought forward um, Bjorkstrand's uh, case as a possible resentencing candidate now that the laws have shifted and they've shifted both in terms of, you know, how we treat younger defendants and also in terms of the enhancements for firearms related to the charges. So the firearms um, charge can tack 25 years to life onto the sentence. And that's what really um, 
compounded Bjorkstrand's case. So he worked with um, all kinds of, you know, multiple angles on on Bjorkstrand's resentencing, and eventually, you know, having served 26 years, he got out. So he's, you know, in July, he's out. Um, they, you know, Thad goes and describes how the two men both narrated the experience of leaving um, the courthouse, uh, walking outside, going and getting a cheeseburger and fries. Every story is a food story. And then, you know, feeling that wonderful, you know, shift into into life again, right? Um, and then going to see his mom and then police surrounding the house and bringing him back to jail. This didn't happen because Bjorkstrand did something while he was out. It happened because of basically confusion, um, it's it's hard to say. I'm gonna guess that we're we're gonna be following up on this and how it's handled. Um, but he was pulled back uh, into custody into custody with officials saying that he there was a mental health hold that had been placed on him, and they had 45 days to do an evaluation. Um, and that was scheduled for uh, to be at Cochrane State Prison. So they transferred him. You know, they took him on a bus and drove him out. And it was this whole crazy thing. And the whole time he's trying to tell himself, this is going to be OK. I'm going to be able to explain myself. But at the same time, super traumatizing. Right. He's been in adult prisons. He started out at San Quentin at the age of six, 16. Um, and when he described things like seeing someone murdered, seeing beatings, seeing, you know, bloody gore in in the cafeteria, you can imagine the panic of being pulled back in, right? Right, right when you've convinced yourself, okay, this isn't a dream, this is real, I'm really outside, and then being yanked back in. Um, at one point, this was sort of amazing, he said that he was like shackled in the police car and the two deputies were transporting him and they stopped and they got him a like a breakfast sandwich at a fast food place. And uh, one of the deputies was like, hey, I got you a double. Remember me in your civil suit. Like everybody knew that this was messed up. <laughs> um, anyway, so he eventually, um, Adrian Kamada was able to come in and file paperwork and, you know, make the approach and, and get him back out uh, within 24 hours. But it was brutal. Um, and... Bjorkstrand's story is not just interesting for the way that, yes, like resentencing is is really changing um, people's lives and is really making us look at why we put people in jail and why we sentence them as we do. Um, but it also really made me, at least as a reader, look at how, how we view juveniles who commit crimes. Um, you might recall, recall we've had stories about ACEs, the adver adverse childhood experiences that lead to all kinds of mental and emotional problems for kids and um, can be indicators for future problems in their lives. I mean, it's, it's all ACEs up in here. Um, he had an incarcerated parent. Um, he had early drug use. Um, he started, you know, I think the first time somebody gave him weed was when he was like nine or 10. Um, by 14, he tried meth, cocaine, heroin, LSD. Um, mm -hmm. And when it came down to um, the actual crime that he went in for, he owed money to a dealer, essentially, who took him to the gas station, drove him there, handed him a gun and said, go get the money, basically. Um, at least this is the, the testimony that is in his files. Um, this seems like a moment where every adult failed him. And it seems like one of those moments where you ask yourself, is it a matter of we need to keep this society safe from this teenager? Or is this a moment where this teenager needs help? And like I said, the, the damage done to Aaron McCaw's life is no joke. Um, but it is really a moment for us to consider what the purpose of incarceration is, 
right? Is it to form? Is it to make people safe? Is it purely punitive? Are we, you know, are we doing revenge here? What are we doing? And what is the outcome, right? Are we improving society by having this person, you know, go in for life in prison, you know, as a teenager? How does a person emerge from San Quentin um, after going in as a child? Um, what kind of adult? comes out eventually when the sentence is over. It's been really um, interesting as Thad has been reporting on this, as he's been like telling me snippets, you know, when we meet up and talk about stories. And a lot of the choices in here that led to this story coming out the way it has had to do with um, Thad's communication with the deputy public defender, uh, Adrian Kamada, also with you know, Bjorkstrand, because he's having to tell his story warts and all. He's having to remind, you know, the public of who he was instead of like slipping back into society and not sharing it. His face is on the cover of the paper and everyone is going to know he shot a man twice, right? And it is a difficult thing to share your story. And it is a risky thing to share your story sometimes because you know, depending on the outcome of a story, it can, you know, the people who work in, in public offices and in our courthouses, they're human too. So we have to think about, you know, how we tell these stories, when we tell them, what impact they might have on on the world around us. And so there was a lot of back and forth and, and talking about what, um, you know, what the subject of a story feels comfortable sharing and whether they're comfortable with basically a warts and all approach. Um, so it was it was really something and to see the story come to fruition after all of the back and forth and the kind of, you know, ethical discussions and the um, and the discussions of of the human beings in this story. I thought one of uh, the more telling passages in the article was about uh, the gentleman describing the Humboldt County Jail and how oh, yeah. when he was a child it was brand new and shiny and now he's a middle-aged man coming back to a middle-aged facility that is now stained and aged and I thought those parallels were really striking and I think that that has done a wonderful job highlighting this resentencing uh, approach, and that I I wish the victim continued healing and peace, and I really wish that this man gets that second chance to make something of himself. Because I don't think any of us would want to be judged for our entire life at the age of fifteen. Yeah. You know, that's the thing about children, right? We are we are meant to um, meant to protect them. And it feels like um, it feels like we fail them all the time. Absolutely. Well, Jennifer, you have done a wonderful job bringing Thad's story to us. I really appreciate it. We have a special story in the news that we're also going to cover. So I'm going to pivot over to Kelby to talk about a story that he brings to us this week about an important switch in Arcata. Yeah, so this week, uh, Merritt Perry became the new city manager of Arcata. And this is coming after a six year tenure of holding the same position in Fortuna. And before I get into kind of the details of, of what this switch means, um, for those who might not know, the city manager maintains um, and he maintains, organizes and manages the activities of of the city council under under the guidance of their direction, essentially. So he's really close to the people when it comes to enacting the the laws that they put forth and all the changes that they've made to the city and, and so forth. Um, for him, the move represents kind of a homecoming for Merritt Perry, because he graduated from Humboldt State University, well now known as Cal Poly, in 1997 with a bachelor's uh, with a bachelor's in science and environmental engineering. Uh, he worked for Windsor Kelly Consulting Engineers uh, around 20, uh, 2003, 
And then he became the senior project manager where he continued that position uh, for GHD uh, after Windsor Kelly and GHD merged. Um, and, and he worked all the way up as a consultant for the city of Fortuna before taking into the city manager position. Uh, Perry says, and though he, though Perry is coming from arguably one of the more conservative communities to a more liberal one, uh, one of the things of note that he's focused on is affordable housing and also improving the city's relationship with uh, local business uh, as well. Um, for him, um, he said one of the things that stood out to me that I really liked is that uh, he says that he likes how the city is, the city of Arcata in particular, is just very open to new things and and he's really eager to start working. And, and though some of the things that he wants to point out, such as like the, the affordable housing and homeless crisis of Arcata is definitely different from House Representative in Fortuna, he says that he understands it will take more time of him, but he's super eager to see what the council members have in store for those matters. Um, another thing is with, because he understands he's coming to a new community, Perry has created a hundred day plan to where he's accessible to the community. Uh, but though he has created this plan, details of what that looks like and everything else just haven't been quite released yet. Um, but he understands the importance of these issues and just creating this plan because Perry is an Arcata local. Uh, he's, as said, mentioned he went to Cal Poly or HSU with Cal Poly, and, and he's even worked at the Safeway across the street from the city hall. And talking to him, he would tell me he would look at that, that city hall building and now now he's working in that city hall building. It's the same neighborhood, but in a different place to his words. Um, and I, as a local, as, as, as an Arcader resident, that makes me just feel so great. But as a person that's interviewed him, I think um, doubling back to his engineering experience, he had a chance to work on the Humboldt Bay Trail north portion. And it's, it's a trail that starts all the way north of Arcata and it stretches way down to Southern Humboldt. And I think one of the coolest things is it said just wa him walking that trail just brings a smile to his face. So you can really tell like he he loves the people, he loves Arcata and he and he loves what he do and that passion definitely shown through in the interview and and just the piece that I wrote on him. So I, I, I definitely hope I did him justice, but that's May uh, Merritt Perry coming to Arcata as the city manager. That sounds like really exciting news. And uh, I wish him all the best. I think anybody that's willing to step up to the plate and try to work on the housing and the unhoused is gonna have uh, quite, a, quite a task, but we need passion. We need innovation to come up with uh, a better path forward. So I'm very excited and I really appreciate you bringing us this story, Kelby. Thank you. Thank you. It was funny because interviewing him, there was eagles, like <laughs> sounded like hawks or eagles in the background. All he needed was just like some fighter jets and like America, the beautiful playing. And you couldn't get <laughs> no much more patriotic than that, to be honest. I think that sounds like a good omen. <laughs> Well, I really appreciate it. Do you have any final thoughts about this story before we uh, move on to a little bit of fun? No, just just like you, Tanya, I wish him nothing but the best. And I, as a resident, I'm excited to see what he does. All right. Well, I encourage everybody to pick up this week's journal and read the entire story as well as the cover story for themselves. They also are gonna wanna flip to this very informative uh, return to some traditional way of living that Jennifer's going to discuss with us, Jennifer. So um, I don't know if you've gone down the rabbit hole of trad wife content on Instagram and elsewhere. Yes, you unfortunately, like, and I'm yeah. going to go think about washing my hands again. <laughs> 
You know, I, it's it's an interesting phenomenon. Um, the, you know, the idea that women can do whatever they want. We have choices. We can, you know, the, you know, some core basic core of feminist ideas of like, you can choose the life you want, but it's supposed to be your choice, right? Um, the trad wife content really seems to have come up into a a post-feminist or like an anti-feminist vibe where it's about like, this is what real women do. This is what, um, you know, a natural woman does. She's not plagued by feminism and making herself miserable. She's out here serving her husband. And a lot of it has to do with kind of like um, very uh, conservative, white, uh, right-wing Christianity in terms of the, a political ideal and a an envisioned utopia, which often looks a lot like old episodes of Leave it to Beaver. But old episodes of Leave it to Beaver if like June had crazy cleavage. So <laughs> the, the content is somewhere, as I mentioned in the story, somewhere between a 1950s ad for Folgers coffee and like 1980s airbrushed porn. Um, again, do what makes you happy, ladies. But uh, most of this content seems to be about reinforcing a, you know, a lifestyle that is very much about making women return to uh, subjugation under men and making housewife duties sort of like a moral achievement and a instead of making it like a basic economic or life choice making that a a moral achievement and also making it a a real um mark of resistance against modernity and a mark of resistance against feminism and honestly a way to beat up on other women <laughs> who don't make the same choices um i saw a lot of this and then you know of course We've all heard the J.D. Vance comments about how the purpose of a postmenopausal woman is the um, raising of grandchildren. <laughs> yeah, wait till you meet my mom. So um, anyway, <laughs> it's been a wild, you know, couple of years talking about what women are supposed to be and who gets to be a woman, uh, what a womanly life is, et cetera. It's been a wild time for people who are actually women to look at everybody else's opinion of how we should be living. And so I kind of imagined instead of the trad wife, the trog wife, meaning the troglodyte wife, because the further back you go, you know, when you have this idea of what's authentic, I feel the same way about Chinese food as I do about femininity. Your idea of what's authentic is different depending on the time, the place, et cetera. Authentic to whom and when and from where, right? So if you just go back to the 50s, yeah, I guess you wanna do a, beave it, a leave it to beaver, uh, June Cleaver thing. Listen, pearls, kitten heels and an apron is a look and I will serve it forever. But that doesn't mean that like my husband's gonna tell me how to vote, you know what I'm saying? So, <laughs> but when we go back further, further and further, if we're trying to go to a pre-feminist era, I mean, feminism has been around forever. And as I know in the story, we can go back to Roman times and find women protesting their lack of rights. So I sort of imagined, okay, what if we went back to some of the earliest possible imaginings of human life? What was it like for women? What is the ideal feminine icon of that time. And recent research tells us that we are not Betty Rubble sitting home, maybe gathering only and sitting home waiting for Barney to come home with a stegosaurus sake. Instead, it turns out that about half of the bodies that have been found uh, in archaeological digs that had like hunting tools on them were female bodies. And somehow lots and lots of researchers went into interpreting the, you know, the artifacts of Paleolithic people with their own sexist imaginings already in place. And now that 
archaeologists are looking back, they're finding that, you know, women hunted a lot. Women did lots of different kinds of community skills and a lot of things were shared. This idea of men working and women staying at home isn't necessarily carved in stone, if you will. So um, I went back and sort of reimagined what your trog wife life would be like. And a lot of it is like, like, are you a real woman? Do you have a hand ax made out of chipped stone? No? Hmm. Is that a ground sloth dress you're wearing? Um, have you got cave core decor in your cave? Um, I just sort of played with a lot of goofy ideas of the way that femininity is marketed to us as like a natural thing, but most of the time it's fashion, it's trend. Um, uh, there's a passage in there that says, I want to feel cherished and sexy like an old fashioned girl, specifically a cave dwelling Neanderthal or Homo sapien from Europe or Western Asia around the middle Paleolithic era some 200,000 years ago. Specific, I just want specifics. Um, Women back then, by the way, the ideal body type, which as we know, shifts, right? A Botticelli is not the same thing as a Marilyn Monroe, which is not the same thing as a Kylie Jenner. Back then, what you were looking for was short limbs, a sort of a stocky barrel chest, and like large nostrils for warming air in the winter so that you could sprint between trees, but also hunker down for warmth in the winter. You had sort of an elongated skull, very sexy, and then lots of brow ridge over your very big ocular cavities. Um, I, enjoyed, I enjoyed reading through those. I'm not sure how I'm gonna get my feet to be leathery enough to walk around without shoes, uh, but we all need beauty goals. And, uh, you know, you have to prioritize self-care. Hey, I am all about bringing back the waving around of a fire stick. That's, right? that's where you got me. I would right? like to walk around with a flaming stick all day. Yeah. Well, <laughs> Keeping that's cute predators that away. Little... <laughs> <laughs> that's cute. You have one of those little sticks on your keychain to keep you safe. I've got a massive log that's on fire. <laughs> trog life. Trog. Hashtag trog. Date goals. <laughs> Date goals. Yeah, I mean, listen, dating is different when you have your hand axe. It's true. Yeah, when you're wearing the pelt of what you're also serving for a meal, it's different. <laughs> <laughs> this is what this is what the girlies want. This is so the we, vibe. I agree. If we're going back to traditional values, we're going all the way back. <laughs> all right. Thank you, Jennifer. That wraps up our time for this week. The current edition of the North Coast Journal is on newsstands now. Pick up your copy. Do not hit your spouse over the head to get to it. You can get a copy for yourself or you can find it, of course, at northcoastjournal.com. I am Tanya Shrum. Thanks for being with us and staying informed and supportive of our North Coast community. Bye-bye now.